In episode four, Chelsea gets her answer as to what the hell Monks is doing on this detail. He's an addict. After getting shot and taking a bullet for the president, he developed an addiction to painkillers, had to go to rehab, and because he has friends in high places, they told him that if he stayed clean for a year and did this detail, he might be able to wiggle his way back to the president. When Chelsea finds out about this, she's pissed. She already wasn't a big fan of Monks to begin with, but now with this boys club BS, she's even more pissed off. Because she takes this job really seriously. She wants to work her way up. But now she has this guy being given a second chance that she, quite frankly, doesn't think he deserves. She brings it up with him. He admits everything. But then they have to put their issues aside because they have to deal with Maddie's day. And things are certainly developing pretty quickly between Maddie and her teacher. The very next class, they end up hooking up. He does the whole, oh, I'm so sorry. This, this is, no, we can't do this. Knowing full well that they're going to do it. And she, being a sheltered, horned-up 21-year-old, is like, no, bud, you're going to kiss me. And it gets hot, and it gets steamy, and it gets passionate, but Maddie has no idea that all of it's fake. The two continue to hook up the next day, although they have to be covert about it. It does seem like Monk notices something between the two as he's just doing his precautionary checks, but Maddie's pretty certain that nobody knows other than her and her teacher. Now, not too far away, in a dingy, rundown motel, Diane fills Rose in on everything she knows about what her aunt and uncle were into. In return for this information, Diane wants the hard drive. She wants to know what's on it. But Rose is reluctant to give it up because Diane doesn't know who she can trust in the White House. And Diane says, I can trust the president. I've known her since she ran for state rep. That was over 20 years ago. Even after making her case as to why Rose should hand over the hard drive, Rose still doesn't want to. She'd rather attempt to finish the job with Peter than hand it over and risk it getting into the wrong hands. Knowing that she's fighting a losing battle, Diane says, Okay, when we walked in, you said you found something. Follow that lead, find out whatever you can, and just touch base with me. I'll deal with presenting it to the president. Diane turns to leave, and Rose says, Wait, do you know the term osprey? And the only thing Diane knows about is the bird. Rose mentions how her uncle said it, and Diane promises to look into it. A short time after Diane leaves, Peter and Rose head out to that address that Rose found in the hard drive. They don't exactly know what to expect. On the way over there, they discuss what else Rose found on the drive. There were thousands of files, but there was one in particular that caught her interest. It was a file on Omar Zadal. Omar Zadal is the leader of the People's Independence Front, the people that, quote, took credit for the bombing, but then immediately denied that it was them. No one really believes that Omar Zadal or the People's Independent Front had anything to do with the bombing at this point. And plus, Omar Zadal is running for office. He's gone legit. Still, the fact that there is a folder in the hard drive with his name on it is fishy to Rose. She did do a deep dive into Farr and Hawkins, but didn't find anything on the drive with their names. They then get to the location of the address, and it's just a farmhouse. On the drive, it was made out to be an engineering company, but when they knock on the door, it's just some woman who's pretty gruff with them and claims she doesn't know anything. And when Rose and Peter kind of push the issue, the woman presents them with a shotgun. Neither Peter or Rose really feel like getting shot at again, so they turn to go away, but then Rose recognizes the landscape. She recognizes it from when she was a kid. She turns around to this woman and she tells her how she came here when she was a little girl with her aunt Claire. She would play over there and then she came in the house. They made cookies with another woman. And Rose is thinking that other woman is standing in front of her. The woman, whose name is Larna, remembers the story and then realizes who Rose is and invites both Rose and Peter inside. Rose and Peter break the news to Larna that the Campbells are dead. You can tell by her reaction that Lorna legitimately had no idea about this. She doesn't watch the news. Rose then cuts to the chase and says, We know they were spies. We have their hard drive. And that's how we got your address. They start prodding for any information that Lorna might have, but Lorna is reluctant to give it because she feels like the more information that these two have, the more dangerous it'll be for them. Rose, however, says, No, we're way past that. We know somebody in the White House has turned traitor. And whoever that is, we know they're part of the Metro bombing. We're also pretty sure another attack is about to happen. So please, what do you know? 
And Lorna tells both of them that she doesn't know much. Her job was to collect the intel and give it over to the Campbells. And what the Campbells wanted was blueprints for infrastructure, public buildings. With Lorna's background as a civil engineer, she had the contacts to get those sort of things. She doesn't know why they needed it. She never asked. But the files that Lorna gave the Campbells, folks like Rose and Peter, they're not going to understand them without Lorna. They need a civil engineer to explain the details of them. The good news is Lorna is willing to take a road trip and take a look at them. On the way over to look at the drive, Lorna gives a brief background as to how she met the Campbells. It's a nice little insight for Rose, who's finding out more and more about her aunt and uncle, who she thought were just normal people. Lorna also mentions how she knows who Peter's dad is. And Peter gets excited because he thinks that Lorna knew him, but she says, no, I just recognize the name. Now, Lorna is leading them to the building of the blueprints the Campbells wanted. It's in downtown D.C. It's a really popular area. They head to a coffee shop, and they start showing Lorna what is in the files. And a lot of it is just about power grids, gas lines, building structures. And to Lorna's best guess, it was probably the Campbells looking for vulnerabilities for another attack. The thing is, they don't know what exactly the attack would be on. They also notice in the drive that there's security footage for every single camera on the block, and it all dates back to the day of the original Metro bombing. It's not a coincidence. Peter, who was in the bathroom, comes back to the table and tells them that the Metro runs directly under the cafe. He then realizes that the attack was actually supposed to take place at this block. The only reason it didn't was because Peter had pulled the emergency brake and the bomb detonated two blocks away. And after looking at the schematics, they realized that Peter's right. Because if a bomb were to detonate where they're sitting, it would take out two city blocks with gas lines and whatnot. Lorna still doesn't know exactly what they were attacking or why they were doing this, but she does tell both of them, if you want to find out who the traitor is, you got to find out what you prevented that day, what they were trying to attack. They then have to say goodbye to Lorna. She desperately wants to get back to her home, where she feels safe. But right before she leaves, Peter says, wait, you knew my father, didn't you? And Lorna says, no, I didn't. But I did know two agents who worked his case. Sorry to say, they certainly seem to think he was guilty. And Peter gets upset and yells, well, then why haven't I seen anything about this case? Because up until this point, it's all been under lock and key. But Lorna asks him, what would that change? And to Peter, it would mean everything. But Lorna kind of laughs at that and says, stop worrying about your dad and start worrying about Rose. Shortly after Lorna leaves, Peter gets a phone call from that state trooper friend who he gave the license plate info to. They've located the car. It's in a D.C. suburb. That's because the assassin couple had been playing house there. The female assassin really wants to settle down. She wants a normal life that isn't on the run and killing people. And she thought they could kind of play house for a little bit with a house that is for sale. The fact that the house is for sale and no one's supposed to be living in it and lights on piqued the interest of neighbors. They called the police. The police located the car. So the state troopers are headed over there as well as Peter and Rose. But when they get there, the couple's nowhere to be found because the couple got word from their handler to go and kill Lorna, which they do. So it's another dead end for Peter and Rose. Before the assassins did kill Lorna, she seemed to give up a little bit of information. We don't know what that information is, but what we do know is it's not enough for the assassins or the handler that they can use to get Rose. After striking out, though, at the assassin's attempt at playing house, Peter and Rose end up getting a motel room. Because the motel's book, they share a room, and it allows Rose to continue to go over some of the drive. She continues to look into Zadar, but there's nothing, one way or the other. She thinks that maybe someone in the White House had offered him something to do it, in order to keep their hands clean, but she has no proof of that. It's just a hunch. Peter, though, has brought food, so they decide to have dinner together, and it's really the first time that both of them can enjoy life and not think about their current situation. They do this crazy thing. It's called laugh. The next morning, Rose picks up her investigation, looking at a bunch of surveillance video from the drive. She's looking for shady characters, but so far, she hasn't seen any. She asks Peter if there was any suspects for the bombing, and he gives her the description of the guy with the snake tattoo, but it's really not a lot to go on. He was wearing a jacket and a hoodie. Peter then gets a phone call from Diane, and he fills Diane on the fact that they think there's going to be another attack. 
Diane tells Peter they need to share this news with the FBI. Peter agrees, but when he hangs up the phone, he sees something that really piques his interest. It's one of the surveillance videos. It's from the cafe they were in, and it's a woman looking out a window and talking to herself. But Peter knows that woman isn't talking to herself. She's a Secret Service agent. Because that agent is Chelsea. And now Peter knows that the attack was probably going to be on somebody that she was protecting. But in a really messed up twist, Chelsea's dad, the vice president, is the guy with the vested interest. The guy who was sending assassins to do his bidding via an intermediary. Yeah, that's her dad. Thank you so much for checking out this recap. Please consider subscribing to the channel and subscribing to my Patreon. Hit thumbs up if you liked it. Smash that thumbs down button if you thought it sucked. If you left a comment, I don't get back to you. I usually don't check the comments unless they're like a super comment. Also, if you don't see the next video up on the end screen, not to worry. It'll be up in a day or two.